Hey crew, Joe Hubbard here, and welcome to episode eight of Rants and Raves, the place where everything's music centric. Remember to show some support today by clicking the like button below. And if you haven't already done so, it's really important to me that you subscribe to my YouTube channel. Having a firm understanding of harmony is an essential tool to have as a musician. Too often this subject is either misunderstood or creates a disconnect between the theory aspect and the music itself. Today I'm going to talk to you about why you need to study jazz harmony regardless of the style of music that you play. Now hang with me just a little bit longer. Every now and again I'll get a question from a student that goes something like this. Hey Joe, why do you use jazz standards as a reference point for teaching the subject of harmony instead of just sticking to the standard simple rock and pop tunes that I want to learn to play? The reason for this is that rock and pop music generically tends to be oversimplistic. This isn't necessarily a bad thing, but consider this. Most rock and pop artists for the last 20 years or so have been strictly formulated to appeal to the garden variety 13 year old adolescent. Much of what we hear in rock and pop tonally revolves around three or four chords that are mostly diatonic and usually centered around a major key area. There are some minor key explorations, but they're fairly straightforward and would rarely venture into the world of modal interchange. The main benefit in studying the harmony of jazz standards as opposed to limiting yourself entirely to rock and pop harmony is that if you ever want to step out of that comfort zone and play tunes by popular artists such as Stevie Wonder, Burt Bacharach, Sting, Donald Fagan, or even the Eagles and Billy Joel, you're going to need to have a decent understanding of jazz harmony in order to do that. Another thing that always makes me laugh are people that say, I really want to study with you, but I'm really afraid that you're going to turn me into a jazz player. Well, I've never told any of my students what to play. That's their choice. I'm only concerned with teaching the nuts and bolts of solid musical concepts where you'll be able to play what you hear while understanding how to play over a set of chord changes in real time, regardless of style. And let's make no mistake about it. Becoming a good jazz musician is no easy task and in many cases becomes a lifelong ambition. What I'd like to do now is analyze a jazz standard by Antonio Carlos Jobim called Wave. Fully understanding what I'm about to describe goes way beyond the scope of this particular episode, but if you'd like to take this further, there's several study options written in the description box below that you can explore with me later. One of the things that often gets missed when looking at this tune is that the A sections are really based around a blues progression. Scanning the form of the A section, you'll see that it's 12 bars long. Bar 1 starts with the 1 chord, bar 5 then goes to the 4 chord, and then at bar 9 it uses a turnaround that takes us back to the 1 chord. This is exactly the same form as a blues progression. This tune is in the key of D major, however the intro is based on a 2-5 vamp which is D minor 7 to G7. As a playing concept, we would play over this in the same way that we play over any 2-5 pattern. But as you'll see, when the same vamp comes up within the body of the A section in bars 11 and 12, it starts to function more as a 1 minor 7 to 4 7 progression. In the first bar, we have a D major 7, which is 1 major 7. This is followed by a B flat diminished 7 in bar 2, which can be looked at a few different ways. One way is to see the B flat diminished 7 as a voicing over an A root note, which turns it into an A7 flat 9 chord. I often use the A as a root in this song over this chord when I play it, and that would be analyzed as an extended dominant pointing towards the D7 flat 9 in bar 4. Another way to see this is as a descending chromatic passing chord. One thing to note is that Jobim wrote a lot of his tunes on the guitar. With that in mind, if he was playing a B minor 7 voicing in bar 1 over a D major chord, which is a diatonic substitute for the one chord, then it would create that chromatic voice leading down to the B flat diminished chord and then leading us eventually into the A minor 7 at bar 3. Skipping ahead to bar 4, the D7 flat 9 is called a secondary dominant, which leads us into the 4 major 7 chord in bar 5. The A minor 7 that precedes the D7 flat 9 is called a related 2 minor 7th chord. Remember, the 2 is only at the party because the 5-7 chord invited it. 
In bar four, we have a four major seven chord that's followed by a four minor six in bar five. This is a good example of what's called modal interchange. The four minor six is borrowed from the parallel minor key, which would be D minor. Let's go ahead and skip forward to the 10th bar where we'll have the A7 on the last two beats of that bar. That's going to function as 5-7, taking us back to the 1 minor 7 to 4-7 vamp in bars 11 and 12. Again, bars 11 and 12 are another good example of using modal interchange. Now, if we look backwards towards bar 9, we've got that E7 chord on the second two beats, which is a secondary dominant functioning as the 5-7 of the A7 chord. The B flat 7 at the beginning of bar 10 is a tritone substitute for the E7. So if we then go back to bar 9, we note that it starts off with a B minor 7 over E. That's a slash chord, which is just another way of writing E7 sus 4. So that whole bar contains chords that are functioning as secondary dominant chords. Finally, filling in bar 8 and bar 7, we have some more extended dominant chords there. The bridge is fairly straightforward as it modulates through a couple of 2-5-1 sequences in the key of F major and E flat major. The last bar in the bridge is A7 flat 9, and that's going to function as a 5-7 chord, leading us back to the 1 major 7 chord in the final A section. I'd be remiss not to mention my book, Functional Harmonic Concepts, that covers all these subjects in great detail. In this book, I break down and explain everything there is to know about major and minor harmony in both diatonic and non-diatonic contexts. It also covers many other subject areas, including slash chords, modal interchange, secondary and extended dominance, tritone substitutions, contiguous two fives, modulations, turnarounds, and pedal points, along with a harmonic analysis section where I take apart 15 different jazz standards. Please follow the link below to get your copy now. So until next time, practice smart, work hard, and play creatively. Thank you.